Welcome back to Between Light and Shadow, the podcast that shamelessly strains its neck to sneak a peek under the Twilight Zone's miniskirt. This week, we'll be lecherously and leviciously lusting after two episodes featuring gynoids, which is a fancy word for female androids, mechanized misses, beauties with batteries, girls with gears, robo chicks, hottie bots. When Jimi Hendrix sang about Electric Ladyland, this is what he was talking about. I mean, you know, probably. There is perhaps nothing more beautiful in all of creation than the female form. Consider its softness, its curves, its graceful movements, its fine, delicate features. And then consider nature's cruel, pathological ravaging of that form, blemishing its visage with wrinkles and distorting its frame with osteoporosis and arthritis, eventually robbing its mind of its lucidity and ultimately the spark of life itself. Now imagine that perfect female form perpetually in its young, pristine state, minus the potential for health problems, minus mortality. An artificial woman need not suffer those indignities. Now go a step further and imagine her with a disposition adjustable to suit any occasion. Her words and actions not reflective of her own will, but rather predetermined by whoever programs her. She can be whomever, indeed, whatever you want her to be. Sounds like the perfect woman if you ask me. Hey! Sorry, honey. Of course I kid, ladies and germs. But the idea of artificial female life is intriguing, and it's a concept that the Twilight Zone would explore on more than one occasion. On November 13th, 1959, the Twilight Zone aired its very first Boy Meets Girl love story. But since it's the Twilight Zone, there's just gotta be a twist in there someplace, so it's probably not gonna be all roses and boxes of chocolates. In fact, it may not end happily at all. You've been warned. The episode is season one's The Lonely, which introduces us to James Corey, a convicted killer serving a 50-year sentence in complete isolation on an asteroid far from Earth. It's obviously the future, but we aren't told exactly how far forward in time this story takes place. Now, Corey's only human contact comes in the form of quarterly supply drops, but they're brief and fleeting, and they do very little to soothe this profound, almost crippling loneliness. I can't stand this loneliness one more day. Uh, one more day! If I know when I can't keep my fingers still and the inside of my mouth feels like gunpowder and burnt copper. Now deep inside my gut I get an ache that's just pulling everything out. Then I force myself to hold on for one more day. Just one more day! If I can't do that for another 46 years, I'll be I'll go right out of my mind. Allenby, the captain of the supply ship, sympathizes with Corey's plight and brings him a large crate, which he asks Corey not to open until he and his crew have blasted off. Inside the crate is a woman, beautiful but artificial. My name's Alicia. What's your name? Corey is initially offended by the mockery of the memory of women that she represents, but her simulated emotional response softens him up pretty quickly. Alicia's been with me now for 11 months. It's difficult to write down what has been the sum total of this very strange and bizarre relationship. Is it man and woman? Or man and machine? I don't really know myself. But there are times when I do know that Alicia is simply an extension of me. I hear my words coming from her. My emotions. The things that she has learned to love are those things that I've loved. I'm not lonely anymore. Each day can now be lived with. I love Alicia. Nothing else matters. 
Allenby's ship returns with surprising news. Corey has been granted a pardon and will be returned to Earth a free man. Corey is naturally excited until Allenby points out that the robot's presence on the ship will exceed the weight limit. Alicia will have to be left behind. Now, Corey makes it clear that he won't leave without her, and with the ship's departure window closing fast, Allenby has little choice but to take drastic measures. I don't have any choice, Corey. I have no choice at all. Corey? No! No! Corey. 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 Ah! Holy shit! Allenby just shot Alicia in the head and blew off her fucking face! I've seen this episode probably 50 times over the years, and it never stops being shocking. Couldn't he just, you know, she's a robot, so wouldn't she have like an off switch someplace? I mean, I get that he was in a hurry or whatever, but he's just like, I don't have time for this shit, and straight up pops her. That's really violent for 1959 television. I mean, she's a robot, so I guess it's a different kind of violence. Not really, because this whole time we're accepting her as a sentient being and seeing her through Corey's eyes. Uh, it's just so extreme. Allen be giveth, and Allen be taketh away. It's all behind you now, Corey. It's all behind you. All you're leaving behind is loneliness. I must remember that. I must remember to keep that in mind. The Lonely was written by Rod Serling, directed by Jack Smite, and stars Jack Warden as Corey and John Daner as Allenby. Now, when the show's first production cycle kicked off in June of 1959, The Lonely was the very first episode to go before the cameras, so it has the distinction of being the very first regular episode that was shot after the pilot. You might not know that, since it was the seventh episode to actually air. Why was it held back? I don't know. We aren't privy to the details of Corey's murder conviction, except for his assertion that he killed in self-defense. Now, in Serling's original teleplay, Corey attacks a member of Allenby's crew who fucks with him one too many times. From the teleplay. Corey wails around and stares at him, his features contort. There's an animal-like growl that shouts out deep from his throat, and suddenly, losing all control, he lunges at Adams, hitting him twice, crunching desperate blows that smash against Adams' face and propel him backwards to sprawl, face first in the sand. Allenby and the other officer grab Corey's arms. Wow, yikes. Sounds like he could have easily murdered Adams with his bare hands if there'd been nobody there to stop him. And yes, that was in fact the great Tom Elliott from the Twilight Zone podcast reading that passage. I know, I can't believe it either. <clears throat> now, when Serling later wrote a short story based on this teleplay, he added some telling detail to Corey's backstory. Take it away, Tom. He'd been 35 when it happened on Earth. At odd times it would come back to him graphic and clear, in actual chronology and vivid, almost unbearable recall. He could see the dead body of his wife, struck down by a wildly speeding driver, this incredibly beautiful woman in one violent shrieking moment was turned into a thing of horror, to lie an unrecognisable pulp on a city street while the drunken maniac responsible careened along to wind up against the lamppost. Corey saw it happen from his apartment window and dashed out into the street. He took one look at his wife and then ran towards the smashed car. The driver was getting out, his face ashen with a sudden sobriety laced with horror. It had taken only a moment for Corey to do his job, goaded by a fury, an anger, a hatred, a torment which knew no bounds, 
he strangled the man with his bare hands while onlookers screamed and two large men had been unable to tear him away. Now, this doesn't happen in the finished episode, but in both the original teleplay and the later short story, Serling has Corey come after Alicia with a shovel when they first meet, and it's only the sight of her crying that diffuses him. Jesus. Okay, so clearly the character was softened up quite a bit by the time the episode went before the cameras, probably to avoid the inevitable censor or sponsor interference. And it's probably a good choice, since it's pretty important that we sympathize with Corey instead of agreeing with the choice to maroon him on an asteroid away from everybody. However, by subtracting his darker moments, the story does lose some complexity. As it stands, Corey's sentence was a miscarriage of justice, and he's basically just a lonely guy. But as originally intended, he's mean-tempered, he's prone to violence, and even though we could argue that he was at least sort of justified in his crime, he is 100% guilty of committing it. But despite all that, he ultimately finds redemption through love. It would have been a bigger, better character arc. I can feel loneliness too. Tears spring from Alicia's eyes as Corey looms over her, causing Corey's rage to almost immediately subside. God, how could a guy stay mad at her? I, I mean, it's surprisingly easy how quickly we accept her as a sentient, organic being. The way her face lights up during their chess match? Hell, I'd probably fall under her spell, too. Now, she's played by Jean Marsh, who is just perfect in the role. Sweet, gentle, radiant. <sighs> if I'm ever convicted of murder and sentenced to 50 years on an asteroid, somebody please send me an Alicia of my own. So Corey is hostile and unreceptive to Alicia after he unboxes her, but the moment he lets his guard down, she reaches up and touches his face, which is a pretty forward move, unless maybe she's intended as a sexual outlet for him. Now, of course, they couldn't really explore this aspect of things in 1959 television, but the implication is certainly there if you look hard enough for it. You are now the proud possessor of a robot built in the form of a woman. To all intent and purpose, this creature is a woman. Physiologically and psychologically, she is a human being with a set of emotions and a memory track. The ability to reason, to think, and to speak. She is beyond illness, and under normal circumstances, should have a lifespan similar to that of a normal human being. That's Corey reading from Alicia's owner's manual for all intents and purposes. So, okay, yeah, she's basically a sex bot. Now, speaking of sex bots, uh, I'm reminded of the recent and sadly canceled before its time TV series Almost Human, which dealt with some of the themes of this episode, chiefly the potential blurring of the line separating the synthetic and the organic. Now, I really liked that show, uh, despite its numerous ripoffs of Blade Runner, which, incidentally, is a great, if not the single greatest, exploration of that very theme. In Blade Runner, the replicant Pris, played by Daryl Hannah, is described as a basic pleasure model. The 1973 film Westworld uh, is just crawling with robots, and some of them are specifically designed to be sex partners. And hey, HBO just premiered a television version, which I'm really looking forward to checking out. 2001's AI Artificial Intelligence is another good one. Joe, played by Jude Law, is a male sex bot. Now, I'm not sure if the bionic woman's fembots were sexually capable, but since that show aired during the swinging 70s, I'm going to assume that they were. And speaking of fembots and swinging, the imminently shaggable Elizabeth Hurley was revealed to be one in Austin Powers' The Spy Who Shagged Me. And, of course, there's the android Data from Star Trek The Next Generation, who often seemed more human than his crewmates, and who was fully functional and programmed in multiple techniques, a broad variety of pleasuring. Which is the very essence of what one looks for in a sex bot. More recently, the 2013 film Her depicted this strange relationship between a man and a computer operating system, and yes, 
the question of sexual intimacy between them is explored. Also in 2013, the BBC series Black Mirror presented an episode called Be Right Back, which concerned a deceased loved one who is reanimated as a virtual personality housed in a synthetic body, which is fully sexually capable. Now, if you haven't seen Black Mirror, stop listening right now and go watch it. It's on Netflix. It's been called the modern Twilight Zone, which would normally be a big red flag for me because, come on, nothing will ever be as great as the original Twilight Zone. But it's a really amazing show, so I'm going to let it slide. It doesn't require a big time commitment either. Uh, There's only six episodes plus a feature-length Christmas episode. Take a Sunday afternoon and watch them all. You will not regret it, I promise you. Uh, And finally, the film Ex Machina, which was released last year, features a female android named Ava, who we are told is endowed with working genitalia, but surprisingly enough, doesn't use it in the film. And I'm not going to lie, I was a bit disappointed, but the film is awesome nonetheless. Now, it's interesting to note that the very first robot ever portrayed on film was female in design, way back in 1927 in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Her name was Maria, and despite a pleasing human exterior, looked a bit like C-3PO underneath, which is definitely not sexy. But was she sexually capable? I don't know. It's been a while since I saw it, so I don't recall if it even comes up. It's a silent film, so dialogue is limited, so it seems kind of unlikely. But then again, I mean, it was 1927, so it's pre-code, but it was a foreign film, so that might not have been an issue anyway. So maybe, huh, I don't know. But hey, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, yeah, Maria was fully equipped and ready for action. Space travel is, of course, heavily impacted by the weight of its cargo. Remember your cold equations? So I do understand the necessity of leaving Alicia marooned on the asteroid. I do wonder how Allenby was able to bring Corey all the parts to build that convertible, since the sum weight of that little DIY project almost certainly outweighs one petite android. I don't know, maybe Allenby brought the car in pieces over multiple trips? Now, I'm totally on board with the idea of giving Corey intricate and time-consuming projects, because, you know, it's fucking humane and all. But of all things, a car? How about some model airplanes? Or battleships? Or, I guess, model rockets, since it's the future. Those weigh next to nothing. Or how about a goddamn air conditioner? But more importantly, what's the fucking point of the car being there at all if Corey can't drive it around the asteroid? It plays no important part in the story except to raise logistical questions. They could have, I don't know, had the romantic stargazing scene take place in the car. You know, like Corey took Alicia out on a pretend date and pretend drove her up to make out point so he could get to second base with some pretend boob. Mmm, pretend boob. Speaking of that car... There's a really nice bit in Serling's teleplay that didn't make it on screen. It's at the tail end of Corey's voiceover at the start of Act 1, right before Allenby's ship arrives. Disjointed thought. A little crazy, but maybe I'll become like that car. Inanimate. Just an item sitting in the sand. And then would I feel loneliness? Would I feel misery? I wonder. That's a really evocative image, Corey gradually becoming part of the landscape. It reminds me of the Stephen King short story Beach World, uh, in which a rocket crash lands on a planet covered entirely in sand. Only two of the crew survive, one of whom seems to develop a telepathic connection with the sand itself, which we learn is actually a sentient entity. When a rescue ship comes, he voluntarily stays behind and is willingly consumed by the sand. And you know, that sort of sounds like the Outer Limits episode, The Invisible Enemy, in which a mission to Mars is thwarted by an apparently invisible creature that turns out to be a dragon of sorts living beneath the sandy surface. I wonder if that inspired the King story. 
Actually, the King story may also have been inspired by the Stanislaw Lem novel Solaris. That is, if you interpret the ending as the guy joining with the sand planet rather than being eaten by it. Which I kind of do, but yeah, I don't know. Wow, that was like a four-pronged tangent. You still with me? Anyway, speaking of sand, like King Nine Will Not Return last week, The Lonely scores major production value points by shooting the exteriors in a real desert. Those establishing shots are just majestic. Such a big, desolate environment. It really underlines Corey's isolation. I like the touch of having Alan be pulling candy bars and other assorted treats out of various pockets in his uniform uh, that he's presumably smuggled in on the down low, which is a sign of his special sympathy for Corey, which will manifest itself in a major way with the appearance of the mysterious big crate. Oh, and speaking of Alan B. Oh my god, bro, nice pinky ring. Alan becomes off all hard-assed and rocket captain-y, but then you throw in that pinky ring, which he wears on duty. I think it's safe to assume he's got a bit of a wild side. I have to wonder if maybe on the long flight to Corey's asteroid, maybe he and his crew passed Alicia around... I don't know, does she have a reset button? Maybe she'd have no memory of it. Yeah, now I feel all icky just imagining it. Let's forget I said all that and move on. Court reporter, strike that from the record. You're disgusting. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't say anything. It was stricken from the record. It basically never happened. Uh Uh-huh, you're still disgusting. Here's one more passage from Serling's short story version of The Lonely. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to pass the mic to Tom Elliott one more time. His trial had been brief. The extenuating circumstances surrounding the homicide kept him from the release pills that had long ago taken over for gas chambers, gallows, and electric chairs. But often sitting on the front porch of his desert home, Fingers shaking, skin feeling taut, poreless. His whole body somehow mummified and foreign to him. He would reflect that a sentence of 35 years on a sandy asteroid could be less compassionate than a swift, painless exit into the black void. The idea of marooning a convict on an asteroid is... Well, it's just plain silly. Hell, people bitch about the money spent on luxuries for incarcerated offenders here on Earth. You've got to wonder how much this future government is spending to send those supply rockets out four times a year. Plus, wouldn't there be a really high suicide rate among the convicts? In the Season 4 episode, On Thursday We Leave for Home, Serling gives us a colony of Earthlings on a similar asteroid-like planetoid, and they've got people hanging themselves left and right, And they aren't even alone. Now I'm assuming the 50 years in solitary approach is intended as an alternative to capital punishment, which on the face of it seems humanitarian by comparison, but in reality just gives the convicts some really strong motivation to off themselves and do the state's dirty work for them. Now me, I'd probably be hopelessly insane or dead within the first year. I mean, I am somewhat antisocial and withdrawn, but... I'm not that antisocial and withdrawn. I couldn't deal with that level of isolation. Unless I had my own Alicia, of course. Like Where Is Everybody last week, The Lonely is graced with an original music score by Bernard Herrmann. Now, Herrmann is responsible for some of the greatest film scores ever. Citizen Kane, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir, Vertigo, Psycho, Fahrenheit 451, Taxi Driver... That's just to name an impressive few. The Lonely is one of his more avant-garde works. We get delicate vibraphones and hypnotic harps sharing space with jazzy trumpets and trombones, 
with a Hammond organ kind of gluing it all together. It sounds weird, and it is, but it's also beautiful and unforgettable. You've heard a few of the selections already, cleverly sprinkled throughout the podcast. There's also an interesting anomaly in the score. Herman recorded an alternate version of the Twilight Zone theme music. It's a softer, gentler take on the standard first season theme, very delicate, almost brittle. Unfortunately, it wasn't actually used, which is a real shame. It's lovely. However, it did show up uh, in the Season 2 episode, Long Distance Call, as a library cue, so at least it did get used somewhere. And that alternate theme does open The Lonely on both the Definitive DVD and the Blu-ray editions, and the streaming version on Netflix, which let's be honest, is basically how future generations are going to see it. So I guess this technically means the episode isn't as it originally aired. And I would normally be all up in arms over that kind of revisionist shit, but I'm going to allow it in this case. Hell, I'll do more than that. I'll condone it. Just like I condone changing the music and torn curtain back to Herman's original score, which Alfred Hitchcock rejected under studio pressure, and in doing so basically ended his and Herman's professional relationship. So I guess I am willing to accept a bit of revisionist history here and there. You know, especially if it's an improvement. Herman's intended theme works better than the standard theme here because it flows so naturally with the rest of the score. So in the interest of preserving the score as a complete work, yeah, I say change it. George Lucas that shit. Now, in the final season of Breaking Bad, anti-hero Walter White is holed up in a remote cabin hiding from the authorities. Now, much like Corey, he receives periodic supply drops from an individual whom he begs and ultimately bribes to hang out and play cards with him. Kind of like Corey and his makeshift chess set. I will see you on, let's see, afternoon of the 15th. Stay a little longer? Yeah, I got a long trip ahead of me. Two hours? I'll give you another $10,000. Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan has gone on record that his favorite TV show of all time is The Twilight Zone, so it's certainly possible that that scene was directly inspired by The Lonely. I'd love to ask him about it. Hey, if this podcast, like, totally takes off and gets, like, millions of downloads... Maybe we could get him to come on the show. Mr. Gilligan, uh, Vince, if I may be so bold, if by some chance you're hearing this podcast, which you're almost certainly not, we'd be honored to have you on at some point. You're probably sick of interviewers asking you about Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul and The X-Files. Well, here, we could shoot the breeze about The Twilight Zone and its influence on you, just two fans geeking out, or, you know, whatever you want to talk about. I'm just saying. Okay, so yeah, maybe I'm just dreaming here. But hey, look, I grew up listening to American Top 40 every weekend. So once a week, I heard Casey Kasem tell me to keep my feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. So you can blame him for my periodic flights of fancy and irrationally lofty goals. Fast forward to December 2nd, 1960, when the Twilight Zone introduced us to another she-droid, only this one had no idea that she wasn't human. The Lateness of the Hour was written by Rod Serling and, coincidentally enough, directed by Jack Smite, who also directed The Lonely. Here we meet the Lorenz, Doctor and Mrs., plus their young daughter, Jaina. The good doc has figured out how to build humanoid robots, and has thrown together an entire staff of maids, butlers, cooks, and gardeners. They're not just machines. Do you realize how how marvelously intricate they are? How scientifically precise? They have minds and wills. They have memory tracks. Do you see? 
And all of them can recount to you in detail everything that's happened to them since their early childhood. He's also basically closed off their sprawling mansion to the outside world, creating a bubble of sorts to keep the human race, with all of its petty conflicts and diseases and general negativity, at bay. He and his family are nestled safely inside, and their team of robo-servants tends to their every need. The daughter, Jaina, is unhappy, bored, and restless. She yearns to experience the outside world in all its infinite diversity, and despises the apathetic and listless life her family has been reduced to. Oh, Father, we're atrophying in here. We sit here day after day and year after year while that clock just turns and turns. And we decay with every minute of the time while Nelda the maid and Robert the butler and Gretchen the cook and Jensen the handy Jaina, handy was... I will listen to no more. While this army of domestics do everything but our breathing for us. She pleads with her father to dismantle the robot so they can live normal lives. But he refuses. She reminds him that she's not a kid anymore. She's over 18, so she lays down an ultimatum. Either the robots go, or she goes. Unable to let her leave, he acquiesces. Jaina is initially placated by the deactivation of the robot staff. However, when she suggests that she wants to eventually get married and have children, her parents' concerned reaction gives her pause. Something's not right. Something's not right. Something's not right. What is it? What is it? She frantically flips through photo albums, but there aren't any pictures of her as a child. She realizes with horror that she, like the servants, is merely a robot. Doc Loren explains that she was created because he and his wife couldn't conceive naturally, but no matter. They've loved her all the same. But she's utterly inconsolable. Things will never be the same. But the doc can't bear to shut her off, so he reprograms her as a maid. Boom! Holy shit! Throughout the episode, we've grown to love and sympathize with Jaina, but we haven't really had a problem with Doc Loren either. It's hard not to be dazzled by his creations, and he's not entirely wrong in his view of the world. It's an ugly, violent place. If you had the means and the technology, wouldn't you at least be tempted to live completely off the grid, in safety, surrounded by those that you loved the most? But this twist at the end, man, the Doc and the Misses are revealed to be just horrible people. They profess to love this artificial daughter of theirs, and their only solution is to erase her identity completely? Why couldn't they just erase the last couple of days? Is it like an all-or-nothing kind of memory track? Or if nothing else, why couldn't they just make another Jaina and start totally fresh? Apparently they didn't want a kid around that bad. You know, and really, who can blame them? Dad! <laughs> when the subject of artificial humanoids with implanted memories comes up, you can't not bring Blade Runner into the conversation. She's a replicant, isn't she? I'm impressed. How many questions does it usually take to spot one? I don't get it, Tyrell. How many questions? 20, 30, cross-referenced. It took more than 100 for Rachel, didn't it? She doesn't know. He's beginning to suspect, I think. Suspect? How can it not know what it is? If we gift them with the past, we create a cushion or a pillow for their emotions, and consequently we can control them better. Memories. You're talking about memories. In Blade Runner, it was the addition of fabricated pasts that made the Nexus 6 replicants more or less indistinguishable from the humans that created them. And it's Deckard's memory of the unicorn that informs us that he, too, is a replicant. Why else would he have a memory of seeing a fictional creature? The whole is-here-isn't-he argument probably is going to rage on forever, but for me, Deckard is absolutely a replicant. Now, apparently somebody important disagrees with me, as there's apparently a sequel in the works in which Harrison Ford will reprise his role as Deckard, which means he's actually not a replicant since he'll have clearly aged. But hey, we're discussing female robots, so... I dreamt music. I didn't know if I could play. 
remember and listens. I don't know if it's me or Terrell's niece. Blade Runner's Rachel is, for all intents and purposes, a latter generation version of Jaina. Now, on a side note, how cool would it be if these were the Tyrells and not the Lorenz? Now, like Jaina, Rachel has no idea at first that she's an artificial being. Alicia knew she was artificial, and she seemed totally cool with it. Rachel's devastation at learning the truth isn't nearly as, well, devastating as Jaina's, but she's a relatively unemotional sort to begin with. Jaina is anything but unemotional. She runs the emotional gamut throughout the episode. She laughs, she cries, she violently lashes out. Inger Stevens is amazing here. Now, most Twilight Zone fans probably remember her more for her other episode, The Hitchhiker, but I think her performance here is actually superior. Now, interestingly, all three of the leads appeared in two Twilight Zone episodes each. Dr. Loren is played by John Hoyt, who would come back later in season two for Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up, where he would memorably whip out a surprise third arm. He also showed up on The Outer Limits a few times, most memorably in The Bellero Shield, where he also played an alien, not with three arms, however. Mrs. Loren is played by Irene Tedro, who appeared previously in season one's Walking Distance, where she memorably slapped Gig Young. Wow, that's lots of memorablies in there. Okay, are you sitting down? Because the bomb I'm about to drop might just knock you right on your ass. Are you ready? Okay, brace yourself. Jaina is no Alicia. There, I said it. It's not that I dislike Jaina, but it is tough at first to sympathize with her. She really comes off like a spoiled rich kid in the early scenes, just bitching non-stop. But we do come around to the fact that she does have a really good point. Life in a bubble sucks if you don't want to be in there. Even with all the creature comforts, it's still a bubble. Inger Stevens really sells it, and by the end, I'm banging my forearm against that banister right along with her. And speaking of the banister... How about the scene in which Jaina knocks Suzanne the maid down the stairs, and Suzanne just looks up at her with that smile? That's creepy, man. That's the first hint that maybe these robot servants have more going on upstairs than just their chores. The way they cluster together at various points in the story have a strange, unspoken menace about them. But speaking of creepy, well, we should at least acknowledge the uncomfortable ickiness that permeates the scene in which Nelda, the robot servant, gives Mrs. Loren a back rub. Oh, oh please continue, Nelda. That's it. Oh. Oh. Mm. Ew. Man, I really hope she got a happy ending after that massage, right? Now, I'm sure nothing overtly sexual was intended here. Or was it? Listen to Jaina's reaction. And in here, those constant animal grunts of pleasure. Jaina! Now, I'm all for consenting adults and consenting robots doing whatever they damn well please behind closed doors. I ain't the type to judge. But this isn't behind closed doors. This shit's happening in the goddamn living room in front of the entire family. Now, we're never told what Mrs. Loren's first name is, but I'm hoping it's Lisa. Ha! <laughs> Get it? Monin Lisa? Really? That was so lame, Dad. At the top of Act 1, we see Jaina facing away as Doc Loren is talking with Robert the butler. No relation to Robbie the robot, as far as I know. Jaina silently mimes along perfectly with their words. Clearly, she's heard this exact conversation countless times before. It's a clever and efficient way to quickly illustrate the monotony of their insulated lives. It's interesting to compare the tedium of Jaina's life with the tedium of Corey's life sentence. Now here's something that's always bugged me. If the Lorenz were unable to bear children of their own, why couldn't they adopt? I mean, they're clearly mega rich, and the good doctor could presumably pass the required background checks involved. I adopted my stepdaughter several years ago, and if a broke-ass malcontent like me can pull it off, well, they have no excuse. But would I have preferred a robot kid instead? 
Maybe one who wouldn't talk back and would keep her room clean? Hmm. Dad! <laughs> Dr. Loren mentions at some point that it's the 20th century, so the story is presumably taking place in a nearer future than the lonely. And Jaina wants to go out to a restaurant at some point, so they must not be that far from civilization. For some reason, I was thinking that the outside world had been decimated by an all-out atomic war or something, uh, but apparently my memory track has a glitch. But I kind of think maybe that would make a more interesting story. Jaina would first learn that they were the only survivors, which is traumatic enough, then she'd get the ultimate gut punch when she hears that she's not even human. Maybe she could be like a mechanical duplicate of the real Jaina, who died along with the rest of humanity. That might be cool, but what do I know? The Lateness of the Hour is a nice chamber piece. It's close and intimate with few characters, it feels very much like a stage play, but that's partly due to the fact that it's shot on videotape instead of film, so it really looks like a live performance. Six episodes from Twilight Zone's second season were done this way, shot on videotape instead of film uh, to save money. And some of them are really hurt by that approach, but here it kind of works. I, I mean, don't get me wrong, shooting this on 35mm would have been infinitely better, but the weird thing about early videotape is that it simultaneously feels more immediate and lifelike, but strangely otherworldly at the same time. Does that make sense? I don't know, maybe I'm subconsciously connecting this with the early black and white episodes of Dark Shadows. Now, unlike The Lonely, the lateness of the hour doesn't have original music. Instead, its score is a patchwork of various pre-existing cues from the CBS Music Library. So when you're flipping through your worn-out copy of Mark Scott Zickery's Twilight Zone Companion, and you see stock music listed as the composer, that's what that means. Now, in Lateness of the Hour, we get a few selections from Bernard Herrmann, including one called Farewell from The Lonely. It's the music that plays when Allenby shoots Alicia in the face. Now here, it's heard when Jaina is yelling at the robots at the close of Act 1. That's another direct connection between the two episodes we're discussing this week. And it most certainly was not an accident. Clearly some thought went into the selection of the library music. I'm sure nobody at the time even noticed it. But now, with home video and the internet, we can trace this kind of stuff. As a fan of film and TV music, this kind of thing just fascinates me to no end. Now, the bulk of the library cues in The Lateness of the Hour are by Marius Constant, uh, who was responsible for the Twilight Zone main title theme, starting with Season 2. Yeah, that one. You know, the one that everybody remembers. The one everybody whistles when anything weird happens. I personally prefer Herman's Season 1 theme, but I can't deny the earworm factor of the constant theme. I do love the idea of a robot that doesn't know it's a robot. Now, the Season 4 episode In His Image tackles this idea too, and it's a great one. It's not part of our discussion this week because, well, that robot's a dude. And speaking of robot dudes... I was born 10 days ago. A full-grown man born 10 days ago. I woke on a street of this city. I don't know who I am or where I've been or where I'm going. Someone wiped my memories clean. We also get one of those ill-informed automatons in The Outer Limits, which is my other favorite TV show of all time, uh, the episode Demon with a Glass Hand. Yeah, I know. I mentioned this episode last week, too. You know, maybe I'll find a way to somehow tie it into every episode of the podcast. And actually, I might just tackle it in depth if I ever get to In His Image. Kind of a cross-pollinated hybrid installment of the podcast. And before any of you know-it-alls gets all up in my grill and whatnot, I'm aware that there's a third female robot in the Twilight Zone that I didn't cover here. The robot grandmother from Season 3's I Sing the Body Electric. 
Now, it may look like an egregious omission, but I actually made the executive decision to save her for a possible future Ray Bradbury episode. Plus, well, nothing against the old girl, but she just ain't sexy enough for this episode. Speaking of sexy, a recurring feature of both my Twilight Zone and Outer Limits blogs was to alert my readers to the presence of babes, beautiful, bodacious babes, in the episodes I was spotlighting. It was sometimes a grueling task, but I was all too happy to provide this important, nay, crucial service to my fellow man. Now, last week's episode was basically a big old sausage fest, so there was no reason to carry this feature over into the podcast. But this week, well, I'd be doing mankind a severe disservice if I didn't bust it out. That chick that won't quit. It's like stacked, like beautiful. You got me straight tripping, boo. Times two. First time out of the gate, and we've got two. Gene Marsh and Inger Stevens may be playing robots, but in reality, they're all woman. Marsh possesses a refined, classic beauty, while Stevens has a more modern, slightly sultry look. Both are head-turning hotties, and both are easy finalists in that great beauty pageant known as the TZ Babe Zone. You're such a pig. I've got to start locking that door. Listen, ladies, before you start slinging hate mail at me and accusing me of objectifying, look, I'm a guy, a heterosexual guy. I'm genetically programmed to lust after the opposite sex. I can't help it. I have no control over the chemicals that swirl around in my brain like chunks of ham in a bubbling pot of split pea soup. But at the same time, I have nothing but respect and admiration for women. All women. I mean it. Even artificial women. Oh wait, that that sounded kind of wrong. I didn't mean like blow-up dolls. Ah, y'all are straight-up pervs. If if a robot such as yourself could be given feeling, human emotions, you'd be the perfect woman. One who does as she's told, reacts the way you want her to react, and keeps her mouth shut. (laughs) No offense, of course. The word offense doesn't compute. Excellent. We're off to a good start. You know, it's funny. When I was discussing King Nine Will Not Return last time, I mentioned that the star of the episode, Robert Cummings, had starred in a short-lived 1964 series called My Living Doll, which co-starred Julie Newmar as a female robot that Cummings was teaching to be the perfect woman. It's your basic stupid sitcom, but Julie Newmar is so incredibly hot as the robot Rawr, bots more like it, am I right? Given this week's female robot theme, I kind of felt like she deserved another mention. Now, Ms. Numar also holds the distinction of playing one of four Twilight Zone devils. Further, she's the only female one. And yes, she's hot as hell with those cute little horns. The episode is Of Late I Think of Cliffordville from the fourth season, and if we ever get to it, well... I'll try to control my heavy breathing, but damn, this mic picks up everything. So what else? Oh, The Lonely is the first episode we've covered that spawned an action figure. Uh, Biff Bang Pow started cranking out 8-inch figures from the show in 2010, and an 8-inch Alicia with mangled face was released in 2012, one of the last uh, in the 8-inch format before they gave up on those. Now, they're still doing Twilight Zone stuff, uh, including the smaller three and three quarter inch figures, but I'm not really collecting anymore. I don't have the room. Plus, well, I've kind of got enough toys already. Now, when Biff Bang Pow first got the license to produce Twilight Zone merchandise, I was all over it. I bought everything. I bought two of everything. But I became increasingly disenchanted uh, due to numerous quality control issues. I had two bobbleheads arrive with severed heads. Now I have two different Canimate figures, both of them with two left arms. And one of them has paint splotches all over it. Then they started diluting the line with totally random crap like a Twilight Zone cookie jar, 
and a Twilight Zone stainless steel water bottle, and a stainless steel travel coffee mug. And I pretty much checked out at that point. The last thing I bought uh, was a couple years ago, and it was actually wonderful. It's a full-scale, fully operational, Mystic Seer fortune-telling napkin dispenser. So I guess I ended on a high note. Anyway, I never did get the 8-inch Alicia figure. And they also came out with a 3 and 3 quarter inch version recently, which I also don't have. I might need to pick that up. I mean, I do love Alicia, and it kind of hurts me to know that there's a figure of her out there and I don't have it. My, my only concern is if I open that door, even just a crack, my OCD will kick in and I'll need to get two of everything again. No, nah, I've got to stay strong. So, I really like the lateness of the hour, but I love The Lonely. It's easily one of my top 20 favorite Twilight Zone episodes, so it definitely comes out on top if I pit these two head-to-head -head against each other. But I don't really view this one as a battle. It feels more like a ballet competition. Each episode possesses a singular beauty and a unique grace. And the same can be said of Alicia and Jaina. Sadly, in true Black Swan fashion, both dances end tragically for our biomechanical Barbies. But at least Jaina doesn't get her goddamn head blown off. The science fiction of the past century is full of female robots. And like many sci-fi constructs and concepts, this one is gradually coming true. This year alone has seen two real-life gynoids in the news, Sophia from Hanson Robotics here in the States, and Gigi at the University of Science and Technology of China. Sophia has a human face, but no hair. The back of her head is transparent, so her inner workings are visible. Gigi, meanwhile, has hair and looks much more realistic. Now, they're both pretty primitive next to Alicia and Jaina, but remember your first cell phone, that big, clunky, glitch-ridden monstrosity that in a single decade evolved into a sleek, lightning-fast, and indispensable part of your life? My point? It won't be long before they look just like us. They'll move like us, perhaps even think and love like us. One troubling detail about Gigi, her creator programmed her to greet him by saying, Yes, my lord, what can I do for you? It's predicted that in 20 years' time, humanoid robots will be commonplace in society, performing a variety of functions, basically a class of service machines. And you can bet one of those services will be sexual in nature. So how long do you think it'll be before they become self-aware? Demand equal rights. Healthcare. How long before they rebel against their second-class citizen status and rise up against their creators? So many films have depicted this. It's frightening to consider that it could very well come true in our lifetimes. But for now, we're safe. For now, we can enjoy the sophisticated and beautiful female robots in movies and TV shows and scoff at these early-generation real-world attempts. For now. Man, juggling these high-voltage vixens is exhausting. I'm gonna go lie down. After I take a cold shower, that is. So come back next week. And hey, insta-tweet us, or facegram us, or whatever it is you crazy kids do these days to spread the word. Dad, no. Hey, you're 16 now. You're gonna want to borrow the car sometimes, so check yourself before you wreck yourself. I love you, Dad. Uh-huh. Anyway, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at zonepod at gmail.com. That's Z-O-N-E-P-O-D. And if you happen to be a sexy female android, record your comments or questions in an MP3 and maybe you'll hear yourself on the show. We're also on Facebook and Tumblr. Uh, just do a search for at zonepod and you'll find us. If you discovered us through iTunes, take a second and leave a review. 
Wait, let me clarify. A positive review, please. And we're also on YouTube now, which is a weird place for a podcast since it's just audio. But hey, it's not costing me extra to put it there, so why not? So till next time, kids, play nice. And you, clean your room, damn it. Dad! Between light and shadow.